we are going to uh, start with uh, this session, who is going to be chaired by Julia Rigoni. Julia is already with us, and I give you the floor. Julia, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Francis. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today at the Women and Diversity in Cycling session of the 10th International Travel Demand Management Symposium. I'm Julia Grigoli, I'm a transport planner with Sistra and also a researcher in the topic of gender and cycling with the Dublin Cycling Campaign. So I'm very excited uh, to be chairing this session, which uh, promises to be very interesting and thought-provoking. The session will explore the topic of uh, gender and cycling, starting from the basic fact that transport systems and cycling facilities aren't uh, gender neutral. We will see how constructed normative roles have an impact uh, on how women experience uh, cycling infrastructure and services in a different way uh, compared to men, but also how gender influences a different interaction within uh, cycling clubs. Women's trip patterns can be very different from the typical A to B commute trip, as uh, women tend to trip chain, making shorter and multi-purpose uh, trip uh, that are often related as well to caregiving. And these type of trips are often neglected in the transport planning practice. So this session will uh, shed some light uh, on these issues and biases, remembering that uh, despite uh, the difficulties that women can experience, uh, uh, still can experience with cycling in certain countries, uh, um, and especially from uh, ethnic minorities, uh, um, the bicycle, even hundreds, uh, uh, hundreds of years later after its invention, uh, still means emancipation and freedom for many women around the world. So let's uh, introduce. Uh, so, so we have, uh, we will have uh, three presentations at this session, and uh, every speaker will uh, will have ten minutes uh, for their presentation, followed by um, ten minutes uh, for question and answer and um, panel discussion. And before we begin, I'd like to remember uh, to remind the audience uh, of um, the rules for question and answer. Only uh, written questions will be accepted, so attendees won't be able to formulate questions live. And we ask you as well to please identify yourself uh, by writing your full name and organization you belong to before asking a question uh, later on through the chat. Um, so let's start now. Uh, with the first panelist, uh, Michaela Wittbringer uh, from University of Copenhagen and uh, Tingo. Uh, Michaela is um, a Danish scholar and a PhD from University of Copenhagen and Department of so Sociology. She has a long professional interest in uh, intersection of gender, diversity and climate issues, as well as worked extensively with gender and diversity in transport and mobility. She has worked in China with affiliation of both Beijing and the Fudan University in Shanghai and um, has been active in various councils and editorial boards with, uh, within gender research. And today she'll, uh, she will present uh, uh, for who does the transport system care for? Mobilities of care in cycling. Um, I leave the floor uh, to you, Michaela, uh, and I will... Um, yeah, mute to myself now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, Michaela. Sorry, I... Thank you. Good no. Okay, that's great. That's good. Now this... Uh... Okay, let me put it down. Um, I can't show my webcam. Yeah. So it's working? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. 
Yes, I will uh, present research that I have uh, conducted together with my my colleague uh, Malin Henriksen from uh, VTI in Sweden, um, and which we have done during the the Tingo project. And the title of the, my talk is "For Whom Does the Transport System Care? Mobilities of Care in Cycling." I would like to start with one of my own experiences uh, of mobility of care in cycling. Uh, every day my five years old son and I cycle to his kindergarten. He rides his children's bike and I usually ride a cargo bike, which allows me to pick him up if his courage fails, which it, which it rarely does. He is a committed cyclist who likes to talk and show his new cycling tricks on the way. On one of those engaging morning rides, a large truck was parked on the bike lane with long steel scaffolding sticking out from the end. My son, who was busy cycling, cycled, cycled directly into one of the steel wires. He was hurt and shocked, and so was, was I and the scaffolding workers. As I said, it was very lucky that he wore a bicycle helmet. So mobility of care is a concept that comes from feminist geography, where scholars have defined mobility of care as the practice of escorting dependents, such as, as uh, children, and household maintenance trips, for example, food shopping. Um, one can wonder why we should care for care trips. There are several arguments. Caring labor is gendered and mostly performed by mothers to understand the mobility needs and uh, opportunities of people. We need to include these experiences. Otherwise, the planning will be gender blind. Also, the ACA children's mobility. If we want to understand children's uh, or how children travel, and also if we want children to be able to travel by themselves, we need to understand the norms and experiences and emotions that surround these trips. And lastly, car trips constitute a big share of trips. Again, if we want to understand uh, traveling, we must include car trips in research and in planning. So previous research has highlighted some of the issues that are specific for caregivers, mostly women uh, who cycle. Uh, safety concern, the lack of a safe infrastructure is even more pressing when you're riding with kids. Traffic is perceived as more risky and dangerous. You are responsible for not only yourself, but also for a small person that might, might lack the competence of biking. Then there's the time crunch. To cycle with kids takes uh, additional time, which makes it uh, more difficult to choose the bike when the, the, the car is uh, faster and might also be perceived as uh, safer. And then there's economical concerns. Uh, to buy additions to the bicycle is costly. A cargo bike is uh, a big investment, but other types of equipment is too. For example, child seats, extra helmet, new bikes for the kids as they grow. And if you have a lack of resources or economic resources, then it can be difficult to engage in biking fully. So, Cycling with children, also called co-cycling, is a distant mobility practice and also distant from cycling alone. So, in our research, we have added mobility of care to the bike sharing agenda. We could ask what experiences we have uh, on co-cycling with children on shared bikes. And in my case, I have none which in a way also is quite telling. 
Yet we did some case studies on use and non-use on bike sharing schemes in the context of uh, Denmark, Copenhagen and Sweden, Linköping. And these countries have a high gender equality in, in biking. They have high uptake of cycling, including cycling with children, and they have explicit uh, policy goals that target increased cycling. We studied bike sharing schemes in these contexts using different sets of methods. One of these was uh, research interventions, where we did the street surveys, observations, interviews, focus groups with both users and non-users of bike sharing schemes. And I would like to share some examples um, from this fieldwork uh, that highlights care and cycling. Here we have a quote that emphasized how bike sharing schemes are simply not designed for care trips. A woman from Sweden says this, on a normal day I cycle to work and back home. The days when I'm responsible for getting the kids to the preschool, I take them in the bicycle trailer. Then I leave the car at the, bicycle, at the preschool and cycle to work. After work, I will cycle to the preschool again and get the kids and the bicycle trailer. I have a need for flexibility and I can't go between fixed docking stations. It's not realistic. The same goes with the bicycle trailer. The shared bicycles are not prepared for bicycle trailers. You can say that norms and infrastructures are two very different things. While infrastructure is very material, norms are more fluffy, but both norms and infrastructure shape mobility practices. And we see how norms and infrastructure can be challenging and excluding for some cyclists, um, especially when, uh, when choosing uh, bike sharing. People ask me why such an old lady want to learn to ride a bike. Another one said, an airport and Vesterport, it is really difficult. I don't dare to cycle there. We talked to a few parents actually who used share bikes or bike sharing uh, scheme and perform care trips, but as a part as of a multi-model journey and no one traveled with kids. Um, at the shared bikes. We recognize this uh, time crunch as something that shaped these stories and convenience and flexibility as one reason for choosing bike sharing. A man also in the, <clears throat> in the Swedish session sorry, said this, I first drive my children to the nursery care and to school. Then I park my car at the commuter parking outside the city where it's free to park. I then take a shared bike for the last mile. Using the shared bike bags is more flexible for me compared to walking if the kids get sick or need a quick pickup. So, based on these stories, we ask what's the problem uh, with bike sharing from a gender and diversity perspective. In general, Bike sharing schemes seldom takes diversity into account. The one fits all model dominates. Bikes are designed for persons traveling alone. Also, this, the schemes are mostly distributed where accessibility is already high. And they, they neglect the gender travel patterns. They do not provide for car trips or multi-purpose trips. So by introducing care to bike sharing schemes, we argue that if this, these systems continue business as usual, bike sharing will mostly, most likely not be able to meet a variety of needs and have little potential to be inclusive and smart for all. Also to include cargo bikes, bike carts or child seats in bike sharing schemes would make care trips uh, possible and this we find is a very unmet need 
And lastly, a perspective of care in bike sharing schemes could support cities to achieve goals related to gender equality and diversity, as well as to increase cycling. It could also be a motivation to support new business models that include diversity. So going back to the question, for whom does the transport system care? We would like to ask, does the transport system care for people who cycle with children? In the case of the bike sharing scheme, the answer is a clear no. But looking broader, for whom does the trans transport system care can also be spelled out as a who is prioritized in the transport system today. We could ask if one would see a big truck with long metal wires on a road for cars without signals to show that you need to slow down or be careful. It's also relevant to include a perspective on vulnerability in mobility. Mobility of care signifies a care of the vulnerable, for example, children. Yeah, we might ask if the transport system help us to care for vulnerable mobilities, or simply if the whole transport system care more for the independent, fully mobile, robust, robust mobilities than for exposed groups of mobilities. On Friday, the 23rd of April 2001, uh, 2021, a family cycled for an evening trip in a small Danish town. At the same time, a 29-year-old man was driving way too fast through the town. The family's 11-year-old girl was, was killed when the car crashed into her bike. With this, we argue that the transport system today needs to take serious the mobility of care and cycling, not just as an individual act, but as a shared duty, creating truly safe roads. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this presentation, Michaela. Um, so yeah, all the questions will be at the end. And um, so we proceed now with the next uh, with the next speaker. Uh, so we have Isabel Duxfield from Polis Network. Isabel uh, um, completed her master in philosophy in gender studies at the University of Cambridge, where she researched uh, gender and cycling. And Isabel works uh, with the Polis Gender Perspective in Mobility Task Force, uh, bringing together local authorities, private operators, and mobility experts uh, to shape um, in a pragmatical uh, methodology, methodical approach uh, um, to shape sharing knowledge and best practices. Uh, she has also worked with British Cycling to explore issues surrounding gender and cycling. I leave you now the floor. And yeah, the title of her presentation is a Female Only Cycling Initiative, an Avenue for Gender Equal Mobility. Thank you. Hello, I hope you can hear me well. Um, so add, uh, as our chair said, um, I will be exploring um, female only cycling initiatives um, um, and to explore if they are an avenue for gender equal mobility or if they are creating more um, segregated space and entrenching gender divides in cycling. Um, so let's begin with why is this important? Um, so I this uh, presentation draws from, as the chair said, some of my research um, into um, female only cycling clubs. Um, and my research was exploring why women join female only cycling clubs or mixed sex cycling clubs. I interviewed men and women um, to ask their experiences about these spaces. And so I thought the reason that this is important is because we often begin our conversations about cycling, about um, the assumption that women don't want to ride. How can women be encouraged to ride? So this research was done in the UK, where actually, yes, so only a third of cyclists are women. Women count for a lot less of the cycling um, proportion than men, except I think that we do need to begin the conversation with a slightly different angle for a lot of people. 
Um, and so kind of drawing from the previous presentation, which was also a qualitative study, um, that lots of these um, investigations into female cycling are very quantitative um, and focus mainly on the statistics and don't really get to the heart of why women do or do not cycle. Um, and so my research was quite distinct because I looked at men and women. Um, so to see how masculine and feminine um, spaces were created and how these identities co-constituted each other. Um, and so, as I'm saying, that I don't, women's participation should be pushed, but we need to understand the experiences um, of their cycling. Um, so, in an attempt to promote women's cycling and other sustainable um, transport modes, lots of cities, NGOs, and even the cycling industry itself have established humor only cycling events. So we have some of so the UK's National Cyclist Organization has female only cycle rides. We have the Breeze Rides. We have individual cycling clubs across the UK, um, people at Veloposse and several in Oxford and Cambridge and London, which is where this research was done. Um, and these have been created um, as spaces for women to cycle and to ostensibly feel safe and encourage them to get on the bike. Um, and so um, my key questions were, so why, how and why do women join all female cycling clubs? Why would they join a female cycling club over a mixed sex cycling club? What are the value of these spaces and do they have any shortcomings? Um, and what is the role of the bicycle and cycle infrastructure in facilitating inhibiting and inhibiting women's cycling? So what does the bike itself do? Um, what does the inf cycling infrastructure do? What do bib shorts do for women and in cycling? Um, so why is this critical? Because, you know, as we've seen, um, active travel is becoming an increase, cycling is increasingly popular, especially in the UK, and active travel is increasingly important for reducing our emissions. Um, yeah, issues do remain. So there, as we see here, 73% have never ridden a bike, some studies say, and women are still the subject of harassment on bikes, which is an issue I have researched quite a lot. Um, about women being harassed on bikes and in the street. Um, so why the cycling club? Why is the cycling club a good place to start by looking at cycling? Um, so cycling clubs are becoming increasingly popular um, in the UK. Um, so after the Olympics, lots of people join cycling clubs. Um, these are recreational clubs um, for people who are into cycling already or want to get into cycling. Um, and they have been um, they're also a really lucrative customer base for sports companies. Um, and so recently, there's a lot of women only cycling clubs in an attempt to encourage women into cycling. Um, and so these women joining are, they range from semi professionals to people who have never been on a bike before. And this is really important to look at these places because, it, you know, this is a conference bridging academia and public policy. And this is really useful arena to start at because sports are a critical arena for studying productions and reproductions of masculinity and femininity um, as we see throughout this presentation and um, they it's a really good arena to see how women um, understand their own perceptions of femininity and how men um, understand maleness as well uh, so my key findings here were um, so what I did was for six months, I interviewed women who have joined, who have joined female only cycling clubs, who have started female only cycling clubs, um, who have also been involved in mixed sex cycling clubs. I interviewed men as well who have done similar things. Um, and I also joined a lot of these rides. It took a lot of effort to keep up with a lot of them. And I sought to understand, um, as I've said, why they joined and what they got out of it and the ways they felt marginalized or did not feel marginalized in these spaces. Um, so the things I found out were, so these starting rides, so Breeze Rides, breeze rides these are British um, cycling run rides where women have a chance to get involved in cycling. They're women only, run by women for women. Um, so they're a good arena for women to start cycling, but women said that this was not where they were going to progress as a cyclist or um, take themselves to the next level. And they didn't necessarily feel like they were being made to feel equal as men. Um, though they did value these arenas. Um, so what we can learn from this is that, yes, these females only cycling arenas are really useful uh, for getting women into it, but only for getting women into it. And if we're really to 
pursue equality, then we need to go beyond that. Um, and I found that age was a real critical factor here. Women said that they didn't just want to join cycling camps just because there were other women there. Um, many felt really marginalized. Many older women felt marginalized by younger women um, because they didn't necessarily feel an affinity with them just because they were other women. They felt that um, the industry itself was still marginalizing them. Uh, things like bib shorts, which are all in one where you have it's an all in one uh, outfit to wear for cycling. And they said, actually, well, I can't actually go to the toilet in this. There are no, believe it or not, only one or two organizations actually make women female boot shorts that women go to the toilet in. Um, so they still felt marginalized. And for a lot of people, they, if they had not cycled in childhood, um, they felt they were still on a back burner. Um, so actually, so, what it was really important is to get women in right from the beginning, right from early stage life. Um, and this is a few of the pictures that I took from the different rides I went on. Um, so what are the repercussions of policy? Why is this important for our policy makers? Um, well, it's really important that policies must be used in conjunction with, as with the previous speaker said, care, flexible working campaigns around domestic roles. Lots of these women who joined rides said, I would love to go on more rides, but I can't because they take place on a Sunday morning and I have to look after my kids. Um, the cycling industries need to take a role here. So, so clothes, clothing, cycle brands, events organizations, they need to understand if female only cycle rides are important. Uh, bring in the men, masculinity cannot be ignored. These men that I interviewed were key gatekeepers and their understanding of whether these rides, whether these mixed sex clubs and female owned clubs were inclusive or not was really important whether they were going to be inclusive or not. Um, and finally, so female only side clubs are not necessarily inclusive spaces. You do need to do more. It's not enough just to say, here's a female only cycling club. Now all the women are going to feel included. It doesn't quite work like that. So how can we go further? As the chair said, I have talked about this with British Cycling, where we got a lot of clubs together to see what they could do. Um, and these are the type of things that we came up with. Um, and this, I think this is really important for policymakers in cities too, when they're thinking about this as well. Uh, so as we've looked at before, uh, age is a really important factor. So encouraging women in older age to get into cycling means that female only clubs may need to be specially catered for older women um, or middle-aged women or younger women. Maybe we should look more at age instead of gender. Um, and Places like Manchester are doing this really, really well. Um, people like Sustrans. Um, so we also need to look at um, other intersectional issues. So race, ethnicity, things like this. Um, so as we know, lots of uh, different religions have um, different stipulations with, in terms of uh, mixing of genders. So we have like Bristol's Cycling Sisters. So these are Muslim women who organize cycling. Uh, ref there are refugee cycling groups. Um, there are cycling groups just for younger people. There are lots of different ways that we can get women involved in many different ways. Um, cities, um, they have a lot to teach each other. So people like Vienna and Lisbon um, are designing their cycling infrastructure and designing, diff and designing lots of different things around gender and mobility um, in very different ways. And we can learn from what each other are doing. Um, it's also important to get more women into cycling policy. Um, so we have here we have lots of different organizations that have really pushed for more women in the industry. Um, so as we know, only 22% of women in the transport industry, but this has an impact on cycling too. Um, and so also, this, so here I'm talking about cities and policymakers, but this works for cycling clubs too. Um, so it's really important for them to get together to discuss um, you know, so if we create a female only space, what's worked, what hasn't, how can we pool our resources, um, all of these questions. Um, it's really important. What I learned over my research is really important for these clubs um, and these towns and these cities to talk to each other um, about what's working and what isn't. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Um, okay, so now let's move on to our third and last speaker for today's session. So Dr. Augustus Ababio Donkor, 
who is a researcher at the Transport Research Institute in Edinburgh Napier University. And he has a PhD degree in travel behavior modeling. And Augustus was also senior engineer at the Department of Urban Roads in Ghana until 2016. And his research interests include the travel demand modeling, behavioral economics, and behavioral based travel modeling. And the title of his presentation today uh, is Opportunities and Challenges for Women Using Bike Sharing Services Diamond, da Diamond Data Collection Results. Um, and yeah, he's speaking as well uh, on uh, for um, yeah, the research uh, they did together with Rafa, uh, who couldn't speak today. So, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Augustus. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you, yeah. Good, okay. Are my slides also visible? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm looking at the presentation opportunities and challenges for women using bike sharing services. I'm uh, taking this from the data collection results from Diamond. Uh, Wafa was supposed to give this presentation, but unfortunately she has to step out to attend to emergency family situation, so I had to step in for her. Uh, we'll look at the presentation in the following order, so we'll take a bit of introduction. Uh, we'll look at the bike sharing services and women mobility we have, some of the barriers and challenges Diamond discovered, and opportunities and recommendations on the way forward. <clears throat> Good. A lot of speakers have spoken about bike sharing services already, and so we know in terms of the mobility patterns and trips people make, gender plays a significant role in mobility. Uh, <clears throat> Christian and Joan, or uh, Juan, uh, initially confirmed or collaborated the second point, which says women make shorter trips, okay, than men, and so Diamond also found that yes, of a true, women make shorter trips. Uh, we say most of these trips make use can make use of public transport because uh, because of the short nature and the pattern of women trips uh, make public transport usage at times very time consuming and not much convenient uh, because bike cycling it's it ideal for trips uh, within five kilometers it makes bike sharing services cycling or bike sharing services uh, possibly a better alternative when you're looking at shorter trips so we thought, yes, it would have been a better option for women, uh, but there are some challenges, obviously, that are making it difficult for men to use it fully. Um, we say we have gender issues in society, and the gender or the constructive normative norms in society and the rules about the gender also creates a significant difference and challenge for mobility. I uh, would say gender differences shows in the trips people make, for instance, looking at shopping trips, uh, people who travel with kids, mostly women do, uh, visiting the GP, school trips, work trips, and leisure or recreation. These are trips that you could use bicycle sharing, but gender also plays a role in these trips. We we'll said bike sharing services or cycling in general would have been a better option for trips that are short. Uh, for multi-purpose trips, like we have one user said, she takes the kids to school with the cargo, leave the cargo there, cycle to work, come back, and so trips like this, shorter trips where you have to make multi-purpose trips, uh, by sharing services becomes a better option for cycling. We we'll say when we have trips within the outskirts, most of the trips coming inside the city center, usually you can get trips, uh, uh, public transport that moves into the city center. In the outskirts, usually the frequencies of the public transport services uh, becomes problematic. And so at the places, a bus moves one hour before another bus moves, so in some cases, 30 minutes. And so the frequency becomes problematic. But if it's, we have good quality public, uh, bicycle sharing services within the outskirts, it makes it easy to just move from one point of the outskirt to another quite easily. So with the current system, it's good for leisure or recreation. And so I want to just cycle for leisure purposes. Yes, it's good using the services we have currently. Or for recreational purposes, so I totally just travel to town and just want to get a bike to move around. The current system we have, we say, are good for such purposes. But when you have to look at shopping trips, uh, we say it doesn't adequately support them because most of the bikes do not adequately have sufficient carrying basket to support shopping. 
they, they are also not convenient for multipurpose or multi stop strips. Uh, they do not support strips involving children because most of them do not have child seat or provision to travel with the child or cycle with the child. And they do not also support strips within the outskirts because you don't have a lot of stations in the outskirts of the cities. Some of the challenges that we found from Diamond was it uh, from the survey, from the data collections and for analysis, look, the bike sharing services becomes problematic for the users because in most cases you get to the stations and they do not have enough bikes. So the stations do not even have a bike at all. So you walk to the station to get a bike, you get there and there is no bike to take. We have infrastructure limitations where we don't have enough cycle lanes, we don't have safe cycle lanes, then we have lack of appropriate equipment, we have safety concerns. Uh, for instance, if you look at this, um, <coughs> sorry, one of the issues has to do with MT. Okay, also take your bike at the back docking station. So you get to the station, there are times where you say this, you check on your app, there's a bike at the station, you walk to the station, you just realize so there is no bike there. And so you have walked in vain and you have to just walk and we are just going to look for another means of traveling. Um, we have this image on the right from Edinburgh using Edinburgh just eat bikes. Where the one numbers in green dots shows at the station how many bikes, okay, parking slot or docking point they have. So the number of bikes that can be available. Now there are times where you get to the time, a certain time of the day where at the station there'll be no bike at all. And so if you are not careful, you walk to the bike and get there and there is no bike and you just have to walk away, which is very discouraging if you want to depend on it because then it becomes not reliable at all times if you want to depend on it. And then two, another problem with us too, you take a bike, you travel, and then you finish your, your trip, you get to the end of the trip, you're supposed to now return the bike, you're looking at the docking systems, you get there and all the docking points are full occupied, and so you don't have empty docking point to return your bike, another problem. So you either have to take the bike to another station close by to dock it. And so if you're where you're going is closer to where you are, it means you have to walk cycle somewhere, dock it somewhere, and then walk back, which is also another problem with system two. We have uh, issues with the distances. And so you look at the distances we have between stations. Where from here to here, if you get here and there is no bike, you either have to walk here. Or if I'm returning my bike here and I get there, there's no docking point to return. I have to come here before going back. And so the distances also become a bit discouraging uh, when it comes to using bike sharing services. Now we have some of the challenges we have one I talk about the empty docking station. So you get here and all the docking stations are full. And if they are full and you can't return your bike, you can't dock your bike, it means you have to take your bike somewhere else. And so you are finishing your, your course or your trip, but then you can't return the bike. And once you haven't returned your bike, you haven't ended your trip. You have lack of child seat where most of the bikes do not have child seat or the carry bikes that they had are that small and do not support uh, uh, shopping. Then from some of the opportunities or recommendations we had, uh, realized that yes, they are convenient from the user's perspective. Riding and cycling is a convenient way of traveling. Uh, users suggest it gives freedom and comfort and satisfaction if you are cycling. Uh, we have one user, okay, from my interview who said, look, I remember the freedom when I finally took the plunge and seeing Paris from another perspective. It's really a more a mode of transport that brings lots of joy the feeling of being free when you cycle. Really offers huge freedom. It's great for me, it means being rid of all restrictions. And so in terms of opportunities, women think yes, it's better when you cycle, but then there are challenges that limit some of these things. And we're looking at how some of these challenges could be addressed. For instance, from our data collection, we have three legs of it. We have one where we had this uh, regression analysis. We have uh, where we use the AHP and then the Bayesian network, and then another leg where we did interviews and the results coming from them. Here we had that the perception of safety plays a role. And so one of the aspects has to do with the lowering traffic speed on shared bicycle and car lanes that could help reduce uh, uh, the, the risk, the perception of risk or safety and people might use the services more. Again, we have the visibility and adequate of lighting systems at the docking. So in the night or in the evenings, usually if you don't have natural light, uh, it's difficult at times because there wouldn't be enough adequate light. And so if this, I uh, think that could be addressed and perhaps there could be some good signs. And then we have to pray availability of equipment for transporting kids. And so if the bikes could have a form of bicycle, uh, child seat 
or cargo for carriages for carrying children could also help. Now, from our AHP and then Bayesian network analysis, uh, these are the factors that we find that the top 10 fairness characteristics that we find. One has to do with uh, using public awareness, so having awareness campaign for people to know, uh, looking at cycling which puncho. So, if the services could provide a cycling puncho, like a rain coat or something in the rainy season, avoiding hairy terrain and the rest. Now, the fairness characteristics uh, in both are the characteristics that are uh, peculiar to men and women. So this one we're looking at are the ones peculiar to all of them are peculiar to women, issues that women had. The one in bold are issues that men share with women. That men also think the one in bold are things that they're also uh, particular about and if they could be addressed. And some of them has to do with accessibility and safety and the rest. From our interview, we also come across some of the recommendations and issues uses risk some of them has to do with the designs of the bike if the bike could be unisex enough uh, some suggesting a solution of mirrors or having a broader seat because some of them suggest the seats are usually narrow for especially people that are uh, of plus size or more then we have the cultural constraints where for for shopping purposes some might need to carry baskets that are a little bigger than what we have the provision of child seat for parents who want to travel or cycle with their kids and it's a campaign. Then we have safety aspects uh, which deal with if there could be provision of helmets because one of the issues and the challenges one of the users is at times you want to cycle, you move from your home with your helmet, you get to the docking station, there is no bike. It's either you return home with your and go and put your helmet back or you just go continue with your journey with your helmet in your hands, uh, which is also not that convenient. And so the issue is if the services could provide helmet as part of the bikes. Then when I go, I don't have to carry my own helmet. I could get a helmet with the bike that I'm taking. Then we have improving the visibility of the bikes in terms of the bike designs. The rest, then in terms of accessibility, we have uh, at least making bikes available at all times at the station that giving me the assurance that if I want to use the service, anytime I get to the station, I will get a bike. Or if I want to return my bike, there will be a system of returning the bike without giving me problems. <clears throat> and so we'll look at some of them like traveling with kids and we have at least currently there are systems where we have services that are providing some of these facilities where some have carry baskets where you can cycle you can cycle for shopping and some have seats where you can uh, carry your children or cycle with your children some of them could actually be retrofitted on the existing systems and so these are things that could be done uh, to help and here we have a cargo where you can you can cycle with more than three or four kids in that cargo. And so there are things and systems that if could be implemented could help address some of the issues that some of the women are having. Then to have <coughs> issue with the docking system where you get there and then you can't return your bike because the place is full and so you just have to pack your bike somewhere. And if you can't buy it, it means you have to take it to another docking station where you can get an empty dock, uh, which is an issue. But if this could be replaced with a dockless system where the systems are due reference and then you can send your bike, you don't necessarily have to dock it. And so if there's no docking point, that's not a problem. You can dock it and they just return it and then that's free. Then to here, we'll look at where if the cycles could provide a helmet as part of the bike. And so the bike will be, the helmet will be locked to the bike. And so I can just rent the bike and get the helmet at the same time. I don't have to carry my helmet from home all the time. And one, <coughs> sorry, in terms of safety, like if they could improve, at least they're designed to improve the visibility of the bikes. Make sure if you're cycling on the road, at least the road users or the cars can see you quite easily. Then again, we'll look at in terms of safety and infrastructure, if we could get separate or segregated bicycle lanes uh, and lanes that are shared between bikes and, cycle and cars, if there could be a speed reduction, a 20 or 30 miles per hour rules to make sure it's safe for women to cycle. And then or having a separate lanes to improve the perception of safety and encourage more women from cycling. I think that with this, I will end. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Augustus. That was very interesting. Um, I see that we don't have a um, question from the public yet. Can I ask uh, if all panelists uh, turn on their webcam now, maybe? Okay, we can see you, Michaela and Isabel. Okay, great. I will turn on my as well. Um, 
Okay, since uh, we don't have um, questions from the audience uh, at the moment, uh, is there any question you would like uh, uh, I, to ask uh, to each other? Or I actually actually have a question myself first <laughs> for Augustus. Um, where, which city the data collection uh, uh, involved? I was curious uh, to know in which cities uh, uh, the data you presented relate, uh, relate to. Is that a question directed to me? Yeah. Yeah, we collected data from the UK and from France. And so we had we had uh, interviews from users from, from France and then users interview from users from the UK. And so we try to understand from users' perspective and at times some of them too are operators. Uh, what are some of the challenges and the difficulties they have? Uh, with the user questionnaire, I think it was basically from France. We had data from the UK, but it wasn't as much as what we had from France. And so in terms of looking at it, we have more data from France for the user questionnaire. Okay, thanks for that. Because um, yeah, I was noting the comment uh, about the fact that the uh, bike sharing system had been uh, deemed uh, not uh, useful for multi-purpose trip. And I was wondering what type of bike sharing uh, there are in those uh, cities. Because uh, for example, here in Dublin, you can actually park uh, your uh, the, the bike share scheme. Do, they do the bicycles have actually a, a lock that you can use uh, to park it safe if you need it to stop and then pick up again the same bicycle. So I was curious, maybe but probably yeah, it's not the same in all cities. Yeah, I think the issue with bike share has to do more with infrastructure, where you mm -hmm. can get because the issue we don't have in the UK, we don't have as current, we don't have that continuity in the infrastructure. You can get to a place where you have good infrastructure, you can cycle comfortably, you get to a place you don't have. And so if you want to make a multi-purpose trip, possibly maybe for one part of the trip, you might have a good infrastructure, you get to another point and you might not have a good infrastructure to cycle on. And one of the issue with particular with women has to do with the perception of safety when they are cycling with vehicles. So you could cycle on the road, all right, but once you don't have that confidence, so you don't feel that safe cycling with vehicles, then it means uh, that discontinuity in the infrastructure become problematic when you want to do more those multiple trips. Okay, thank you. And um, actually, I have a question for you as well, Isabel, uh, about uh, I was thinking, what is the um, your experience actually of um, uh, knowledge sharing and of those best practices? Uh, uh, you were saying at the end of your presentation that yeah it, it would be great uh, and i suppose it's one of the purpose of the police network uh, so yeah i was wondering if you had any example of uh yeah knowledge sharing that uh, works successfully and what would you advise for cities where yeah the gender gap is still very high yeah so the reason i have said that knowledge sharing is very important obviously because i am coming from the perspective of Paris network where um, what we do is we bring cities and regions and transport authorities together to share their experiences, their main challenges. Um, and from this research, the reason I think it's super important in terms of female-only initiatives is that when I was doing this research and I was speaking to individual clubs and individual uh, female-only organisations, they had no idea what others were doing. Um, they didn't necessarily know um, the ways that others were organizing. They didn't know how they could join together, things like this. Um, and then when we did the event with British Cycling, um, where we brought several different clubs together um, to talk in a workshop, it was really interesting to see them bounce ideas off each other. Um, so the reason I think this is super important is because as we've seen, actually me and um, Mikala are coming from very different uh, points of view. So as she said, um, um, across uh, Europe, there are many different, um, many different countries and many different cities have different ratios of female to male cyclists. Um, and so the reason it's very important for us to talk to each other is that we're all at different stages um, and we all have very different challenges um, and are trialing very different solutions. Um, and we won't know what's out there unless we talk to each other. Yeah. Okay, actually, we have a question here from Hilda. From Mary Christensen, and um, she says, "Great presentation. It seems as if uh, there are lots of overlapping documentation and findings in various analyses." And yeah, that in 
okay how can the findings be implemented at various levels in europe uh, and regional and local so maybe i don't know who wants to answer this question yeah i think from from diamond's perspective we have a toolbox that uh, bike sharing companies could do a self-assessment of their services to see which are some of the areas they are deficient in and how can they improve their services. And so if they visit the toolbox, uh, the toolbox will have a lot of questions where they have to answer. Answer the questions and then select maybe a specific profile of women you want to find out to give you recommendation on which areas you are lacking and what you can do to improve your services to make sure the system becomes equitable and fair for women who wants to use it and encourage women to use it. And um, let's see. Um, another question for you, Michaela. It's very interesting your research uh, on the mobilities of care. It's uh, something that, yeah, it's surely often uh, neglected. And um, I am. I would like to to ask you if um, some of your findings have actually met uh, uh, people who actually work in the transport uh, practice and planning uh, at least maybe in uh, in Copenhagen or in um, I, I know your research was a uh, joint uh, uh, you had data collected both uh, in um, Denmark and Sweden so I was wondering if uh, your findings helped uh, somehow policy to improve on this regard uh, in these countries or if you have any example of uh, yeah best practice that came out uh, or someone so transport practitioner, transport planners that actually started looking into that? Yeah, we did have, uh, we did in the Swedish context, we did the policy breach, we did a gender and diversity action plan on bike sharing schemes. So there were meetings together with the municipalities and also together with the, the provider of the bike sharing scheme in the, in Sweden, in the Swedish Linköping. Um, so we have at the Tingo Observatory, there are a gender and diversity action plan on bike sharing schemes and a policy brief um, which address like, yeah, planners more. And then we actually, we also had a, we had a meeting with a operator, bike sharing scheme operator to see they were quite interested in uh, looking more into care trips um, which uh, yeah it's uh, surprising that so few bike sharing schemes take diversity and uh, like co-cycling into consideration um, we found one example in Poland which actually had a bike sharing scheme consisting of very different uh, bikes, bikes for children and cargo bikes and uh, with child seats and uh, yeah, different sizes. So, but that's so far the only example that we we have seen. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any other question coming from uh, the audience. We still have a couple of minutes. So I don't know, any other thoughts? Uh, okay, if uh, nothing else is coming, I just would like to thank uh, all our great speakers of this session again once again and yes yeah julia thank you very much for sharing this interesting session uh, we are uh, inviting uh, the attendees and the speakers who are in the parallel session to join us again because we are going to uh, follow uh, and to start with the closing remarks 